So that is the secret sauce. Before we get into the Bible and we read the Bible, pray, thank God, and ask for the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth that he wants to reveal to you. And guys, you know what? I, I, like, uh, I like audience participation, right? So if something resonates with you in this message today, say amen or boom. Okay? Boom. What's the difference? Boom is my version of amen. All right? If something hits you, if something resonates with you, you know, say something, acknowledge it, right? Make this message practical to your life, you know? And I like to hear when something hits you. You know, when God speaks to you, I like to hear that amen. I like to hear a boom. I like to hear a hand clap. Whatever. Don't be afraid to express yourself. You guys ready to get in the book of 3 John? Wow. Come on. Let's do it. All right. So, there, there's three sections of this book. The first section is the greeting. And it goes a little like this. This letter is from John the Elder. I am writing to Gaius, my dear friend, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I hope all is well with you and that you are as healthy in body as you are strong in spirit. For our church, look, two things I want for you because I love you on your past. I want you to be healthy in body. I want you to take good care of your body. I want you to be a great steward of your body. I want you to eat clean. I want you to exercise. I want you to take care of your body. Be a good steward of your body. And I want you to be strong in spirit. Look, let me tell you something. When you do both, you're combined. You have intimacy in Jesus that you cannot experience in any other way. Be healthy in body. Be strong in spirit. That's what I'm praying and I desire for you. Verse 3. Some of the traveling teachers recently returned and made me very happy by telling me about your faithfulness and that you are living according to the truth. I can have no greater joy to hear that my children are following the truth. The next section is a section that speaks about caring for the Lord's workers. Dear friend, you are being faithful to God when you care for the traveling teachers you pass through. Even though they are strangers to you, they have told the church here of your loving friendship. Please continue providing such leaders in a manner that pleases God. For they are traveling for the Lord, and they accept nothing from people who are not believers. So we ourselves should support them so that we can be their partners as they teach the truth. Verse 9. I wrote to the church about this, but Diotrephes, who loves to be the leader, refuses to have anything to do with us. When I come... I will report some of the things he is doing and the evil accusations he is making against us. Not only does he refuse to welcome the traveling teachers, he also tells others not to help them. And when they do help, he puts them out of the church. Dear friend, don't let this be a bad example influence you. Dear friend, let me go back. Don't let this bad example influence you. Follow only what is good. Remember that those who do good prove that they are God's children, and those who do evil prove that they do not know God. In verse 12, everyone speaks highly of Demetrius, as do, does the truth itself. We ourselves can say the same for him, and you know we speak the truth. And then the last part of this uh, letter or book is the conclusion. And this is what it says. I have much more to say to you, but I don't want to write it with pen and ink. He was saying, I want to do it on a Zoom call or meet you in person. Yeah. <laughs> Skype or something like that. All right. <laughs> or I hope to see you soon. And then we will talk face to face. All right. Peace be with you. Your friends here send you their greetings. Please give my personal greetings to each of our friends there. So what's going on here is that John gives his friend Gaius a juxtaposition of two different men who are believed to be in the same church. Look, there are two parallel lives and narratives that we just read about here in this letter. And the one thing that we need to know and the one thing that John wanted 
gave us to know is what we need to know today. He's ready to find out what that is. Someone said, mm -hmm. <laughs> when you say, mm -hmm, you know you're ready to, yeah, to get that revelation through the message today. Come on. So here's the one, one thing that we need to know. And look, write this down. Today, it's today's big idea. So if you can write anything down, write this down. Demetrius was the antithesis of diatrophies. Diatrophies, come on, let me tell you who he is. He caused division. He caused um, nothing but trouble. He caused splits within the church. He wasn't known for anything that was positive, anything that was godly. He was known for only what was negative. He was known for causing problems. Now let's talk about Demetrius. Demetrius was the complete opposite. Now we don't know a whole lot about him, but we do know this. He had a great reputation. And he was associated with the truth. Now, it seems like John personally not calls him out, but calls him up. There's a difference between calling someone out and calling someone up. So John calls him up, all right? And Demetrius had been, he may have been attack, attacking uh, diatrophies. And we see that what John is doing here is he comes to Demetrius' aid. So one guy is known for his, for his problems. And one guy is known for the value that he added to people. Here's a question. Which person do you want to be today? That's the question. Diotrophies or Demetrius? So here's something to think about. When someone causes more problems than they solve, guess what? They're the main problem. What? Diotrophies. He was a big problem for this small church. He was bad. Listen to, listen to how bad he was. He was bad enough that he was written about in this small letter today. Now, watching this letter that we're reading today make it into the canon of Scripture, I think we have to look at this question before we go on any further. We don't see deep theology in this letter. We don't see John directing the behaviors of the church. The reason that we know this is because the second century Church leaders, their fathers, they knew John directly wrote it because they were the young leaders in the church in the first century when John penned this. Secondly, here's one of the things I love about the Bible. What I love about the best-selling book of all time is the beauty of the Bible. It's the only religious text that exists in the world that speaks about real-world problems, real-world issues in the church that they were facing, and the same issues that we face today. This letter shows us the challenges of the church presently and during their time. Now, here's why the seemingly insignificant letter matters to you and I, too. Here's why. Go ahead and write this down. You can accidentally be a diatrophies and causing division in the church and not even know it. None of us would classify ourselves as someone who likes diatrophies and wants to be diatrophies. Uh, but some of us may think that our arguing, criticism, our stances are noble and correct. Do you know anyone like that in any environment that you go to? This is what diatrophies are. He thought he was helping the church by traveling, sending the traveling teachers away and not having them come to be a part of this church. He was actually thinking he was noble, but he was actually hurting the church. And it was so important that God used the Holy Spirit to write this letter to bring about correction with him. And friends, there have been many well-meaning people in the church that have hurt the church. They have caused divisions in the church. They have hampered the mission of Thrive Church or any other church who have wounded pastors and have stirred up divisions. And they all thought what they were doing was noble. I want to give you a personal, uh, personal example. I planted a church before I was at Thrive Church, and I built my core team, and I had this pastor that mentored me. He was like a spiritual father to me, right? And I said, you know what? Hey. I want you to be my assistant pastor at our church plant. 
And he said, yeah, he retired from this other church, but he wanted to work part time. He said, man, this is a perfect fit. Come on my team. We're going to change the city for Jesus. We're going to go reach our community. We're going to disciple people. And they're going to come to know Christ. And they're going to be powerful Christians. And then I noticed one thing. He said, I'm all in. I'm all in. Then we would have our weekly meetings. And then in the beginning, he showed up, man. He was strong. We would go to outreaches. He'd show up and he was on fire. And then, that was just the first month. The second month, he's not making the meetings. You know, he's not making the outreaches. And, and, and so I had, to get, I had to get with him. I said, what's going on? We're going to call him Pastor John Smith. <laughs> Pastor John Smith. Oh, God, please help me not say out of his name out loud. My worst fear is his name slipping and me divulging who this guy is. Pastor John Smith. Pastor John Smith. Pastor John Smith. <laughs> Pastor John Smith wasn't showing up. So I met with him. I said, Pastor John, what's going on? We're having these meetings. Everyone's showing up on my team but you. You're the assistant pastor. He said, well, you know what? I was thinking that I'm retired. And that I'll just come to these meetings and attend these outreaches whenever I felt like the flow was happening, whenever the Holy Spirit led me. And I'm like, hey, brother, that's not what we agreed about. He said, yeah, I'll, I'll change things up. And I said, you know what, Pastor John Smith? <laughs> John Smith, John Smith. I said, you know what, you're being a Diotrophes. I need you to be a Demetrius. And you know what? You're slow, or however the Lord's leading you, is not what we agreed upon. And if you can't be a Demetrius and do what we agreed upon as assistant pastor, guess what? You got to flow on up out of here. <laughs> you got to flow up on out of here. You're my spiritual mentor. You're my spiritual father. I love you, but this is not what we signed up for. What is your choice going to be? Because I am serious about, oh, let me just say this. I'm serious about what you Jesus. I don't believe that anyone, any Christian, any pastor ever retires from the ministry. So he and I are not seeing eye to eye. What I do believe is that we take the message of God across our city, across the world, across our country, wherever we can, to our last dying world. Yeah. That's what I believe. That's me. That's me. So today's action step is this. The same thing I told Pastor John Smith. It's the same thing I'm going to tell you today through our action step, okay? Be a Demetrius, not a Diotrophus. Come on now. Write that down. That's good. We have a story of two men, right? Listen, we get to choose our narrative. We get to choose what the world is going to say about us. We get to choose what others will tell about us. We get to make that choice. We get to choose what's going to be written about us. God has given us that power and control over our life. We have got to either choose to be a diatrophies, who is cantankerous, argumentative. He gossips. He created bad, broken relationships in the church. He had unforgiveness, bitterness, and resentment. Or we could be Demetrius. We could be a Demetrius. And here's the major difference between the two. And go ahead and please write this down. Diotrophes, he stirred up. He caused problems. He was up to no good all the time. That's what he lived for. As we said a minute ago, he created relational break breakdown, anger towards leaders, and he hurt the church. Demetrius, let's just call him D. I want, you know, I got personal effects for you. D, he showed up. D showed up. He was faithful. He exuded the love of Christ. He helped people. He invested into people. He poured into people. He gave to people. He lived his life to carry God's love to other people. D is the main. And we could choose to be a diatrophies or we could choose to be a Demetrius. So, Here's the question. How do we do this? And here's your answer. Go ahead and write this down. This is so good. You're going to write, going to write this down. Being faithful isn't just saying you 
trust God. Let me, let me say that one more time. Here you go. Being faithful isn't just saying you trust God. You know, many of us talk about our faith in Christ. I'm sure uh, uh, Dyer Trophies, you know, he told everyone about his faith in God. All right? He told everyone about he was faithful when doing what he was doing. You know, Pastor John Smith thought he was being faithful even though he wasn't on the same page in his mind. He was being, he thought he was doing a noble thing, but he wasn't. He wasn't. Being faithful wasn't talking about how much faith you have in God or what you're doing for God. I want y'all to get this if you get the name today. Being faithful is about how you are walking with God. How intimate your relationship is with your Savior. Look, if you get anything today, man, my prayer is this. Being faithful and trusting in God, it comes down to your intimacy with Christ. You know, there's a scripture in 1 Peter 3.15. It's not on the screen. It just came to my mind. Why? Because it's always on my mind. It starts off by saying this, but sanctify yourself to your Lord Jesus. Sanctify means, you know what? It means that we purpose your life, we live our life, to seek God before anything. Amen. Anything that we're all in and all out for all in all. Jesus created us to have a relationship with the Father. And you know what? If you want to be successful as a Christian, and if you want to be the Christian, the Christ follower that Jesus designed you to be, this is what we need to do. And it's not talked about so much in the church, but I believe it should be talked about more in the church. So that's why I'm going to talk about it today. Come on. Look, it's so simple, but it's hard to do. I'm going to be honest. we got to get in the Word every single day. We got to get the best selling book of all time and read Jesus' heart. The manual that tells us who we are, how to love ourselves so we can love God, so we can love everyone else. We got to be in prayer every day, communication every day. We got to talk to the one who created us and talk to Him. And then, you know what? We got to be in fellowship like we are right now. Right? The more believers you're around, the stronger the presence of Jesus is. Yeah. Can you feel the presence of Jesus in the house today? I mean, I thought that's where someone would say, boom! Boom! <laughs> and the fourth thing is this. When you love the one that saved your life to serve him, the one that created you to be in a relationship with him, when you love him, you cannot stop talking about him. The closer we draw to God, the more we want to tell God about people. The more we want to point people to our Savior, Jesus. It's just those few things that we need to do every day. I hope this message of anything, you know, when you're driving home and you wake up tomorrow and think, you know what? Hey, I'm going to pray to God. Just give a shout out real quick. God, hey, take it up. You know, start there. Take a little deeper. Hey, you know what, God? I believe in H F. Well, His word, first word. What is it? H W F W. His word, first word. Right? Just open up your Bible and look at your uh, verse of the day. Get that verse and see what God does with it. Let Him feed your soul. All right. Continue. We, get, you know what? In the Western Church, we got church on lock. Right? We come here one Sunday a month, man, but He wants a relationship with us seven days a week. Share yeah. Jesus about what Jesus has done with you and your testimony. And watch what happens when you do that. So how do we do that? Being faithful isn't just saying that you trust God. And as I conclude today, true faithfulness is this. Is God, is he able to trust you? Go ahead and write that down. True faithfulness is, is God is he able to trust you? We all say we're, yeah, we trust in God, but is God able to trust us? Demetrius, he was faithful. 
God can trust him. The apostle John knew that he could trust him. And true faithfulness is asking the question, can God trust you? Ask God that question every day. Ask yourself that question. Can God trust you? Can God trust you to mend and heal relationships instead of being the center of arguments and confusion? Some of you, you know what? You've got estrangement in your family. Can God trust you to pray for those family members that you don't want to be around and that you would prefer to be forever estranged from? Can God trust you to seek reconciliation for your family? Can he trust you? Can God trust you to be faithful even when you aren't feeling? Can he trust you to show up when you aren't feeling? Can he trust you to be faithful when you aren't motivated? To show up and serve others that God sent in your way to minister to. Can God trust you to solve more problems than what you create? My wife asks me that every single day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Can God trust you to be faithful to the mission here at the Rock Church? 650K, there's 650,000 people in our Richmond metro area that are looking for the light that we have so God can bring them out of the darkness. Can God trust you to go all in and all out to devote your life to reaching these people for Jesus? You know, we, we all say that we can trust in God. You know, but can God trust in us? Let me share the story of Thrive. I remember when I first came to Thrive, there were 25 I call them old time saints, right? These people were like 65 and up. Most of them are closer to 80, right? They dwindled down to 25 people and they remained strong and they prayed that God would do a new work, that he wouldn't shut the doors down and they were close to the doors shutting down, very close. And the opportunity to come in and meet with these people. And they said, you know what, we're just trusting God to do a new move here at Thrive Church. We met, we planned to merge Thrive Church with their church. And you know what, they didn't agree with our style of ministry. They were old school. We were a little different, more modern. We started having services, and you know what they said? These old time saints said, you know what? I know God's moving for you guys. I want to serve with you guys. People start getting saved. People start getting baptized. And God was sending more and more people week after week after week. We started in the fellowship hall, right? After a year or so, we moved into the sanctuary. And since then, you know what? God worked with so many people. People are getting saved. People are getting baptized. They're getting discipled, and they're going out. They're changing our city. God is using them to change our city. And it's the story of them. See, they were Demetriuses. And they said, you know, we don't really like everything you do and your style of ministry at Thrive, but you know what? We do like how you, how you are putting God first and how you serve God. And we want to partner with you, and we're all in. We're all in, and we're going all out. And you know what? A lot of them have moved on. They're in their heavenly home right now. There's a few sitting in the sanctuary right now. I look at them. I said, they're the Demetriuses of this church, of the world, of the world. When I think about them, it inspires me to become a better Demetrius. Let's go ahead and pray today. Father, I lift up every single person in this church right here, right now. Father, today touch our hearts and our minds. Father, empower us to be a Demetrius, not a Diotrophius. God, use us to stand up to serve you, to reach other people for you. Empower us to seek you with all our heart, everything that we consist of. Empower us, God, to do what you created us to do, and that's to communicate to you. 
you daily, pray with you daily. Just have a conversation with you. Father, that we will get into your word daily. Read your directions for our life and how we can better help others. Father, give us power to share more about you through our personal testimonies and everything that you've done for us. No one knows our testimony better than us because it's our testimony. You want us to share with other people who are looking for your love. Empower us to be more of a Demetrius type of person as we follow you, Jesus. And during this time, maybe you're in here and you're hearing this message and you realize, hey, I haven't even, I'm not even in a relationship with Jesus. How does that work? Well, the Bible says this. If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord, you will be saved. So what does that mean? That means if you believe that you're a sinner, we all are. We just do the things we shouldn't do, that God is real, and that you're going to die from this life one day, that you'd rather spend your eternity in heaven and not in hell. God says he gives you a special gift, the free gift of salvation. Jesus died on, your, on the cross for your sins, but he also died to demonstrate his love for you. And you know what? I want everyone to know right now that Jesus loves you more than human words could ever speak. He demonstrated his love by dying just for you. And if you believe in these things, now is the time. Today is the day salvation to receive Jesus as your Savior. If that's you today, you're saying to yourself, you know what? I want to accept Jesus as my Savior. Just repeat this prayer after me. You can say it out loud. You can say it silently in your mind. It's just a holy, sacred moment just between you and God. But if you don't say it loud, say it loud. Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus. Give me for all my sins. Come into my heart. Take it over my life. I receive you, Jesus, as my personal Lord and Savior. I repent. I turn away from my whole life. And I'm coming after Thank you.